Okay, I wanted to um, just introduce chapter 11 today. So we'll just talk about the first little bits of nuclear chemistry. So up until now, all of the chemical reactions that we've discussed have essentially been uh, about electrons. Electrons being removed to form cations or added to form anions or shared to form new covalent bonds. It's all been about electrons. Uh, but um, the nucleus of an atom can undergo changes as well. Uh, those are nuclear reactions uh, or a part of nuclear chemistry. So that's what we're talking about, the ways that nuclei themselves can change. And in this case, the electrons and any covalent bonds that are formed or the ionic charge are all going to be largely irrelevant. The nucleus is sort of sequestered and cloistered inside the many shells of electrons. It doesn't really interact with the external environment very much at all. And that makes nuclear reactions very interesting and, and unique compared to normal chemical reactions. So uh, before we can talk about nuclear reactions, we need to build up a few tools about how we talk about a nucleus. So just to remind you, uh, an atomic symbol like this uh, tells you how many of all the subatomic particles are present. So this lower left number here means that there are um, six protons. Uh, the upper number there, 12, means that the mass number is 12. That's the sum of protons and neutrons. So that would be six neutrons. And then the fact that there's no charge means that we've got equal numbers of electrons and protons. So there would be six electrons. Um, that makes uh, uh, carbon-12 a devilishly simple um, uh, atom because it's got six of everything. And there are different isotopes of carbon, so 13, carbon-13 here. Uh, it's still going to have six protons. That's what makes it a carbon. Um, but because of that higher mass number, this isotope of carbon has seven neutrons. The six plus seven is going to equal 13. And then it's got uh, the six electrons. And then you could have something like, say, carbon-12, but maybe it's a two plus ion. Um, so six protons six uh, neutrons, but because it's carrying a positive two charge, that means that it's missing two of its electrons, so there will be four electrons. Okay, now hopefully um, uh, that's a review for you. Now we're going to take this idea of the atomic uh, symbol, and we're going to change it a little bit. In particular, um, uh, for nuclear chemistry, this will still be the mass number, and so this will still be n plus p. Um, but this right here is going to represent uh, the, the charge excluding electrons. This is, sounds a little bit weird, but um, it's essentially still the number of protons for most of our, uh, uh, for most things that we're going to be talking about. But there's going to be one point where it's really going to be generalized to represent something more like a charge. Why don't I just give you an example really quickly? <coughs> so in a nuclear reaction, you'll have something like carbon-14. And carbon-14 is um, an isotope of carbon that will undergo a nuclear reaction to form nitrogen-14. Now nitrogen has seven protons, and so at this point the um, uh, reaction is unbalanced. When we're balancing nuclear reactions, all of the mass numbers on the left should equal the sum of all of the mass numbers on the right, and here we're good, but all of the um, charge numbers on the left should equal all of the charge numbers on the right. 
Um, what we're missing here is a new particle which is also a product and it has a mass of zero and a charge of negative one. And that is an electron. And now this nuclear reaction is balanced. So um, I'm introducing this a little bit out of order, sorry. We'll be balancing a lot of nuclear reactions next week. But I just wanted to um, uh, expose you to the way that we balance these is through using these symbols where we keep track of the mass on top and then right here is typically the number of protons like six protons in carbon, seven protons in nitrogen but sometimes it will be representing a negative charge like say with an electron and this reaction would occur whether the carbon was positively charged or negatively charged or neutrally charged because the electrons are not actually uh, going to affect uh, rates of nuclear decay. Okay, um, so uh, a, an essential part of nuclear chemistry is radioactivity. So radioactivity are the high energy products of nuclear reactions. Um, it was first observed in 1896. Uh, someone had a, a photosensitive paper, basically a, a photographic paper, and it was stored in a, uh, a, I believe in a box, something that was blocking all of the light so that it wouldn't get exposed early so that they could use that photographic paper in experiments or maybe even to take photos. Anyway, it was stored somewhere where it shouldn't have had any light reach it. And someone had a, a block of uranium that they had just set on top and it had rested there for some time. When they took out the photographic paper later to use, they saw a big circle where it had been exposed. It was like the a block of uranium was shining some form of light that passed through the wooden lid of the box and, uh, and exposed the photographic paper beneath. And so that was radiation. Um, uh, and uh, I, and um, that radiation was able to expose the photosensitive paper. So people began to study radiation and they did an experiment where um, we have here on the left side a source of radioactive material. Maybe it was uranium since that was kind of the first material that was discovered to uh, emit this radiation. <clears throat> and it, it's put in a chamber, uh, basically a big metal block that will uh, prevent the radiation from traveling in all directions except out a small narrow hole and that generates a narrow beam of radiation. And then they passed that beam through some charged plates to see does this, does this radiation have a charge? If it is positively charged, then it would be attracted uh, downward toward the negative plate. And if it's uh, negatively charged, it would be attracted upward toward the positive plate. And if it carries no charge, then it would pass straight through uh, unhindered. And they'd put some photographic paper at the other end and see where the paper got exposed to see where the radiation was actually uh, was actually landing. And um, ultimately, the radiation was uh, divided into three different categories. You can see the uh, beta rays. That's a Greek letter beta. It looks like a pretentious capital B. And it is uh, negatively charged. It was... Uh, it was attracted to that positive plate and pulled upward on its trajectory. Uh, beta rays are actually electrons. Um, when I gave you that example of carbon-14 uh, turning into nitrogen-14 plus an electron, that electron was what we call beta, uh, a, a beta particle. Um, it is radiation that is just a very fast-moving electron. 
And then uh, in the middle you see a gamma ray, that's the Greek letter gamma, and gamma rays are uncharged. And what they really are is a photon of light. Now you've heard of visible light and ultraviolet light, uh, and then you've heard of X-rays. Uh, X-rays <coughs> are not the end of the electromagnetic spectrum, beyond that is gamma rays. And X-rays and gamma rays uh, are both products of nuclear decay. Um, and so uh, gamma radiation is a photon whose frequency is very fast and wavelength is very short, probably within what we would call the gamma radiation uh, region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then finally, there are the alpha rays. That's the Greek letter alpha, and it looks like a, a curvy lowercase a. <clears throat> and so the alpha rays are positively charged. They uh, were pulled toward the negatively charged plate, but not quite as strongly as the beta rays. It turns out that that's because they have a larger mass. And so it's harder to deflect them because they have a larger mass. Alpha rays are a helium nucleus. Let me go on to the next um, figure here. So this is table 11.1. Uh, an alpha particle is a helium nucleus. So it has two neutrons and two protons. Um, and it's also traveling very rapidly, up to 10% the speed of light. Uh, so alpha particles can be stopped with like a sheet of paper. Um, alpha particles do not uh, penetrate very far, but they do still carry a lot of uh, energy, and, I, and uh, they are still dangerous as a form of radiation if they were to strike you unshielded. Uh, beta particles, or these electrons that are moving at almost 90% of the speed of light, uh, they have a medium penetrative power, and that means that uh, they'll pass through a thin sheet of paper, but you know something thicker like, say, the um, uh, uh, lead apron that you would wear when receiving an x-ray, well, that would definitely uh, block the uh, beta rays. Um, and then finally here we have gamma. It says high energy radiation. I would say that it's a photon of high energy electromagnetic radiation. It's light. It's just light in a different form than what we're used to seeing with a very high frequency and very short wavelength. Then it's got the highest penetrating power. Uh, that's when, uh, well, depending on uh, the precise wavelength of gamma radiation, it could be stopped by a lead apron, or maybe it would require something like a, a, a thicker sheet of lead to stop gamma radiation. So those are the uh, three different types of uh, radiation. Uh, those are what they actually are. They're very different things. A helium nucleus versus an electron versus a photon. And you'll notice their symbol there um, with the mass number and the charge that we'll use later on in balancing nuclear reactions. So the helium is 4,2, the electron is 0, negative 1, and the gamma ray is 0, 0 because photons have neither a mass nor charge. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll stop it there. So next week we'll get into the thick of nuclear chemistry. And that is the last chapter of the textbook. So we're well on track to finish in time here. And um, I hope you have a great weekend. We'll talk to you next week.